virtual. So I can. welcome oh, everybody. No. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you all for joining us tonight on a, on a somewhat uh, muggy June evening. My name is Ann Thompson. I'm the Assistant Director for Public Services for the Essex Library, and I'm thrilled to welcome you back to what we're teasingly calling our TED Talks um, for tonight with the Centerbrook Architects Lecture Series. It is the finale of our 13th year of the series, and we are extremely pleased to be able to welcome Ted Sorek back for another talk this year. He has uh, provided us uh, two uh, very entertaining and educational talks previously this spring. And if you have missed any of the talks this year, because of Zoom, we've been able to record them and post them to the Essex Library Association's YouTube channel. So you're welcome to go there and view them at your leisure. Um, I, as you may have heard me in the past say, the Connecticut State Library requests us to let them know how many people have attended our programs this year. And so with that, I'm going to launch a poll that asks you to let me know how many people are viewing your screen with you tonight? We'd like to have you keep your microphones muted and your cameras off tonight so that we get the best bandwidth possible. I know there was some thunder rolling around earlier, so hopefully we won't have any uh, electrical issues uh, with the talk. Uh, nothing before Ted is completely finished and we can say good night and then the thunder and lightning can come at will. Um, uh, so with that, we also want to ask that you put any questions that you may have in the chat and we'll get to all the questions when Ted is finished with his presentation uh, and we'll go through those. If you absolutely don't want to put your question in the chat, we'll probably be able to open the uh, microphones up and have you ask your questions uh, verbally, audibly for everybody um, uh, if we get the chance to. Uh, and with that, looks like we have most everybody has responded. Thank you very much for doing that. And I'd like to hand you over to uh, Jim Childress, who is the, uh, a principal at Centerbrook Architects and the, the main driver of some of these talks and my great pal, uh, my husband too. Um, and he is going to introduce Ted. So take it away, Jim. Thanks, Ann. I, I have to shout out to Mike Crosby for introducing us to Ted and Ann's right. This has become affectionately recalled. Hey, we got a Ted talk tonight. Uh, really fun to listen to. He, he is uh, at the University of Hartford in the Department of Architecture with Mike and other great people. He's got a degree from uh, bachelor's degree from Carnegie Mellon and a graduate degree from the AA Architectural Association in London. And he's great fun to listen to. An academic that's accessible and entertaining. It's really a joy. Thanks, Ted. Look forward to hearing Jeb say. Absolutely. Thank you, Jim. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here. And I enjoy sharing uh, with people who have uh, an interest, um, some of you in depth, some of you just sort of in passing. And hopefully we'll sort of uh, entice you and shed some light on some issues. Today, what we're going to talk about is the Italianate Villa, um, a housing type that is seen sometimes hidden because of the way they're designed in and amongst the hillsides and river edges um, along the Connecticut River and throughout Connecticut. It's a housing typology that came into popularity here really through the 1840s to the 1860s as such, but uh, across the United States, it continued on until the 1880s. Um, and it's a very interesting housing type because not only does it have some uh, sustainable characteristics that promoted uh, natural ventilation. And so the whole apparatus, the structure functions using the porches, the windows, which are in many cases actually window doors, um, a series of rooms that have the ability to be opened up in the interior, but then also closed off with sliding doors and a cupola which serves as a chimney that sort of brings cool air from outside the house, in through the house and up through uh, the cupola, um, especially as the heat outside increases. So it's that ventilation that allowed for a lifestyle to develop 
which had not really existed previously. And as we go through the lecture, uh, I hope this will sort of become more apparent as such. So we'll get started. The Italianate Villa, reconsidering the American family. During the 18th century, the Connecticut River supported a thriving maritime and shipbuilding trade and served to maintain commercial connections between Boston, Providence, and New York City. The addition of a rail system only served to ease and encourage travel between these industrial cities. By the 1840s, numerous wealthy families seeking refuge from urban crowds, pollution, summer heat, built retreats in towns along the river. Hartford was one such destination and the area soon supported numerous examples of the inventive Italianate revival style. Spreading throughout the Northern states, the modified Italianate villa quickly replaced various colonial models, such as the salt box and Georgian townhouses as the new residential precedent. This historic prototype was derived from melding the traditional European aesthetics with local materials and a technical understanding of passive house design. Drawing on lessons learned from African slaves in the Southern states, the Italianate villa with its wraparound porch and eyebrow eaves proposed a layering of activity spaces transforming from public exterior to private interior, all while providing naturally ventilated accommodations. In both plan and section, the novel arrangement of shaded porches, expanded openings, and rooftop cupola allowed for the constant circulation and modification of airflow through the building, providing a cool environment, a refuge from the summer sun that was significant to the status and comfort of their owners. And these state-of-the-art structures promoted a more relaxed and social lifestyle, eventually solidifying into an original domestic canon. As the Industrial Revolution began to have a recognizable influence on the expansion, production, and consumption of goods within the American cities, a new wealthy middle class came into existence. Less glamorous and flamboyant than their millionaire counterparts who gravitated to Newport, Rhode Island, these self-made men still sought out social standing and physical comfort. Shipping, banking, and manufacturing interests saw increased wealth for those select few as well as the infrastructure hierarchy required to realize extended quantities of free time. Middle managers could take control while executives took extended leaves. The Italianate villa introduced in the 1830s represents a shift in American domestic architecture and the conception of a new way of life for urban middle-class families. This new house design is not significant for its technological innovations, which were included whenever and wherever possible, but more for its influence on social and domestic lifestyle. For the Italianate villa was developed less as a residence and more as an apparatus to promote support and advance a newly emerging social class, the intimacy of the nuclear family and a recreational lifestyle previously unrealized. As the emerging concept of family and home solidified in social consciousness, 
a new architectural scheme was necessary to support this new lifestyle. Architects like A.J. Downing and John Riddle aided by social reformers and authors like C. Beecher busily developed and published designs to support this domestic ideal. Pattern books and builder's guides featuring Gothic Revival cottages, Italian Renaissance villas, and bracketed or stick styled Gothic Revival cottages were actively published and distributed between 1840 and 1870. The era's Italianate trendsetters recommended floor plans that were relatively flexible with multiple means of access to the outside, free flowing interior passages between rooms and varied opportunities for cultural public celebrations and intimate family nesting. With a plan in hand, all that was needed by an industrious convert was the proper setting, one that could support all the activities associated with a family home. During the summer months, conditions in urban centers were unpleasant, often foul. Unchecked progress during the early 19th century allowed for swells in immigrant populations, increased pollution, and unhealthy sanitary conditions. For the newly emerging wealthy middle class, these conditions encouraged the consideration of alternative residential surroundings. Simultaneously, the suburban countryside was heralded by social reformers, moralists, excuse me, and architectural planners as an Elysian paradise, a sanctuary away from the urban heat filth and disease. As such, the ideal home was soon associated with the pastoral ideal of rural society. The prosperity of early industrialization gave a select few the possibility of relocating excuse me, beyond the city for extended periods of time. Transportation between city centers and rural towns had significantly improved with the introduction of steamships and the railroad. It was now possible to navigate both water and land throughout New England. Therefore, it was only natural that seasonal retreats for the urban middle class would find their way along scenic shores, rivers, and hillsides. In turn, it was also natural that these new social class would look for a physical representation unique to their own identity and purposes. Whoop, sorry. Unlike the New England salt box or the Georgian manor of the 18th century, the Italian villa was not conceived as an agrarian center or a political statement. Instead, the typology represents fashionable status, affluence, and innovation. Here, the architectural style of home, complete with its furnishings and appointments, become an extreme importance as a means of displaying the family's new domestic lifestyle. Philip Ayers relays, that the family in pre-industrial society was characterized by sociability rather than privacy. Colonial households were often crowded with unrelated individuals and teeming with various activities, depriving family members of privacy within the limited space. Numerous individuals of various relations associated with the family's economic and social activities were often present within the house. In this way, the family's public and private activities were inseparable and the family's domestic life was often conducted 
with strangers present. In these limited, often cramped living conditions, rooms were not differentiated into public space and family space. Instead, rooms were rarely designated by function with family members often sleeping behind curtains while social activities were being conducted within the same room. The early part of the 19th century saw the emergence of the home as a private retreat. The concept originated with the bourgeois families in France and England, eventually transitioning to urban middle-class families in the United States. Promoted as the modern family, new ideas of privacy and domesticity were characterized by this lifestyle. As a result of urbanization and industrialization, the workplace was removed from the household and the home as a private kingdom emerged as a new concept and existence. The modern family was defined by its intimate relationships where life was child-centered and in which the roles of husband and wife were segregated into public and domestic spheres respectively. With family time being restricted primarily to the home, leisure became an important aspect of domestic life. Isolated from the anxiety of urbanization, the idealized home was con consciously designed and perfectly managed as a utopian community. The Italianate villa, consisting of a square block with its characteristic wraparound porch and central cupola, integrates aspects of the personal, the social, and the sustainable to advance this new concept of American life and in turn, American values. Functioning as a private retreat and a haven, the domestic nature of the villa allows for the development and enrichment of the nuclear family and their interpersonal relationships. Isolated from work, and supported by staff, fathers and mothers had time to devote to each other, to their children, and possibly various extended family members. Proximity and time were the key components of this trial. Shared meals, conversations, and activities, such as reading aloud, musical performances, nature walks, and various games were promoted to facilitate these interpersonal relationships. The cultural value placed on the nuclear family in America for the next subsequent hundred years has its roots in this idealized familial construct. When it came to the house plans, the new designs carefully facilitated segregation and privacy through hierarchy and spatial arrangement. Within these homes, spaces were organized in a manner that separated the family's public activities, such as entertaining guests from one's private family or aspects such as reading or conversations. The main living floor of the villa required an arrangement of rooms that supported a succession of social activities throughout any social event, including receiving guests, having dinner, possibly followed by a musical entertainment or dancing, even card playing. Hosting these occasions might include the family and as many as four to 20 or possibly more guests. Simultaneously, it was necessary for these same rooms to support the specialized activities of various family members. Private rooms were needed for men's activities such as libraries or studies. 
women's activities, such as music or sewing, and children's activities, such as playing or exercise, were just as significant. To address these dynamic oppositions, innovative main floor designs often featured numerous paired three to four foot pocket doors, which when recessed within walls, created an almost open plan with continuous circulation from room to room. Additionally, when window doors were opened, that circulation continued from porch to room to hall to room to porch, and one could move freely in and out and around the main floor through multiple access points. When closed, the main floor was a collection of individual rooms for dedicated undertakings. If coordinated, the sequential opening of doors could stage activities and settings, reveal events from the intimate to the formal. In this manner, a long parlor could be separated into two or more rooms for family activities or opened up to become a grand space for festival entertainments. The dining room could remain enclosed for intimate family dinners or opened into the study or music room to support a buffet or banquet. The kitchen, which had previously served as the main family room during colonial times, was now relegated to the basement or the back of the house, the domain of servants. Nevertheless, the kitchen remained an integral component of the home, only now as a vital support to the social events that required a whole range of repasts and gourmet preparations. A critical component of summer social life, the addition of a living porch to the main floor extended the family leisure space, allowing for extended social interactions throughout the day and evening. The porch was initially introduced to American architecture through West African shotgun house, a typical slave cabin in the Southern states. An African architectural trait, the porch was quickly adopted by the dominant white culture, becoming an integral architectural feature throughout the 19th century. Although reconfigured to meet contemporary aesthetics, its, important is, its importance is evident by the proliferation of elaborate and ornately crafted posts, lattice railings, and decorative brackets. In fact, the popularity of the Italianate porches led to the creation of furnishings and fixtures exclusively for the exterior socialization. Finally, the Italianate villa was not merely set in the landscape. It actively engaged its surroundings, both responding to it and promoting the reconfiguration of it. To fulfill their dream of a tranquil domestic life, romantic or serene settings were sought out. Adjacent fields were cultivated into grass yards to include lawns for game and sport. Flora was added for color and scent and fruit trees were planted for shade and to attract fauna. Although not a true English landscape, often settings were chosen to take advantage of distant vistas such as towns or sunsets, water features such as rivers and lakes, or natural features such as mature planting and shade trees. Thus, cool breezes could travel up from the river through the orchards 
picking up scent across the porches and into the house. Initially conceived as a seasonal retreat, rarely were these houses used as a main residence. While agricultural entities such as orchards, vineyards, vegetable gardens, or flower gardens may have been associated with these country settings. These were not farmhouses, nor did they support a traditional agrarian lifestyle. Like every other aspect of utopia, the landscapes associated with the Italianate villa were designed for pleasure, promoting an appreciation for horticulture, which turns out was one of the many hobbies actually encouraged by the new lifestyle. When the early 19th century American home builders considered design options for seasonal homes along the Connecticut River, they had a veritable architecture smorgasbord of styles they could choose from. While some were reassured by the symmetry of Greek revival or the exoticism of the picturesque Gothic, many opted for the romantic yet innovative Italian Renaissance styles. The Italianate villa celebrated wealth, taste, and modernity. Three characteristics widely embraced by the emerging urban middle class. However, the Italianate villa was not merely a stylish residence made up of multiple rooms. Instead, it was a carefully calculated, finely tuned domestic apparatus for socialization and segregation, for exhibition and retreat, and for intimacy, yet isolation. It was conceived to nurture the contemporary ideals of family and the home. Yet, Without the carefully applied principles of passive natural ventilation, the prototype might not have been as effective or attractive. However, from about 1840 to well after the Civil War, the Italianate was America's most popular house style from north to south and from coast to coast, canonizing its success and popularity. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions and discuss uh, aspects of this typology. Thanks, Ted. That was wonderful. Um, I, I'm sorry, I missed the years when the, the Italian at Villa was the most popular. Um, it's the most popular from around 18, uh, in, in the Northeast, it's popular from about 1840 until 1860. But um, in the middle states and even as far as California, it continued all the way into the 1880s and even the 1900s. Um, again, we have that slow moving of styles and innovation as they go from the East Coast to the West Coast. Uh, sort of in the post-Civil War period, um, New England really started to kind of reconsider itself and the Italianate villa as seen here as the sort of uh, square block um, became more picturesque and you started to see more influence from things like Second Empire, um, uh, Beaux-Arts and these things, uh, shingle style, Queen Anne style uh, started to come into New England. But really um, before, right before the Civil War, this would be the hot ticket for <laughs> wealthy, innovative, uh, you know, New Englanders. So um, I have a couple of questions myself, and as always, I get to ask mine first. Um, so it looks like from your images, and maybe I am missing um, something here, it, is the material, the exterior material, it all, from your images, it looks like it's been wood in every case. Oh, yes. Does wood, I mean, 
you would think that a brick or a stone house would have kept the interiors cooler in a hot summer. So was wood? Sure. I, I have a feeling, again, since this prototype originally came in as seasonal houses and really as sort of summer retreats, while they wanted to, how can I say this? Uh, I think they wanted to spend the money to acquire the building, but I don't think they really wanted to um, invest as much as they would in what would become a four season house. I think as you start to see this prototype become more of a four season residence and a permanent residence for people, then you get more masonry introduced and uh, those kind of things. Okay, great, good. Also, a lot of the detailing of this, the, the brackets, the um, large overhangs, the ornate porches, the multiple types of shutters, both interior and exterior, and these kind of things um, just kind of were more often made out of wood than let's say masonry or iron. Yeah, kind of thing. sure. Uh, and one other uh, question was in these houses, I was looking at the plan, your room plan, where would the kitchen typically have been because that also produced, would have produced a fair amount of heat. So, the, so what you see here is very interesting. Um, the square block is the main residence for the family. And the wing that projects off the back is actually the kitchen and then the servant hall with stairs that would go up to servant rooms that would connect to the upstairs of the um, family house. Um, so the idea of, in this sense, removing servants uh, as much as possible from the main building becomes an interesting idea. Um, whereas in the colonial period, um, servants, workmen, relatives, visiting people would all sort of be mixed together in one or two rooms as such. Here, um, really that main block is for the family. Um, although this plan doesn't show it because this is actually, this is actually a Habs hair um, documentation of a specific Italianate house. Often they would have sliding doors uh, between rooms and this would allow you to open up all of the rooms. So if you were having 10 or 15 or 20 people over, if you also had windows that functioned as doors onto the porch, you could open all of your windows, which would make them doors, and open all of your interior doors and literally have a space where you could kind of walk from one side of the house through to the other side of the house and into the yard. Um, so if you can imagine people mingling and moving back and forth. Uh, also, I think a lot of the social events occurred late afternoon into early evening because you would get the breezes and things would cool off. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine, you know, people playing badminton or lawn ball or these kind of things, other people reading on the porch, people playing cards, uh, people going into a buffet in the dining room and picking up some food, maybe going into another room where they're having a conversation or yet another room where there's music and some dancing. If you get a little warm, you just stroll out the window onto the veranda or sneak off into the orchard if you would like to be a little bit romantic. Um, yeah, so there's lots of possibilities here. <laughs> that, that's, uh, um, uh, explains my, uh, my, my thought about what would happen. And it, it, it strikes, uh, uh, me anyway, as being rather modern, um, which takes me to a question. And please, everybody, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. And we'll get to them. So the first question was um, a comment that says, it feels like today wanting to escape COVID with the family in the, into the country. Do you see a similar influence on current architecture, <coughs> not building Italian at villas necessarily, but some new version of it? Well, I think what's really interesting here is that ironically, if we go back to maybe um, 
sort of the 1930s, there was a revival in the colonial model, the Georgian model and some of those things, which do not really have a built-in relationship between the interior and exterior of the house. What's really wonderful about this house, and you know, it's a shame because we as architects or even historians look at this very much as a building plan. And I would argue that the lawns and the trees that sort of surrounded the lawn that created shade, the lawn itself was an activity area. You could picnic there, you could play sport there, you could lounge there. Um, the furniture that was created for the Italianate villa was lightweight wicker. So it could be moved around really easily. You could take it into the yard. You could bring it back onto the porch. Um, you could go off and you know sit under a tree with some friends uh, if you wanted to. I think the modern house, the house that we see people being drawn to today, has some of these features. And you know there's a desire to have French doors onto porches and, you know, have a sort of developed exterior space, whether it's a deck that steps down into a yard or those kind of things. Um, however, here it, it sort of goes hand in hand because while one could say the emerging modern family created the architectural prototype you could also say that without the architectural prototype, you would not have been able to facilitate the relationships of the modern nuclear family. The really interesting thing about this plan is that it really pushes everybody who's not family out of the house. <laughs> uh, and, hello? And then it allows situations where, um, how can I say this, the family can get together. So, you know, the father can be in the study and close the doors and work privately. And then when he's finished, open the doors and that might connect to the dining room or it might connect to a music room. And after dinner, the family can gather in the library where, which would be potentially the father's space and read together and those kind of things. So there's a whole series of activities that were associated with this lifestyle. And I don't think there's actually a rule of etiquette, but there's kind of this conception that if you build this house, then you want to have that kind of lifestyle. And so these are the things that you should be doing, if that makes sense. Yes, very Edith Wharton. Yeah. Um, so another question is, how did it get the name Italianate? Well, it's Italianate because if we go here, um, the buildings on, maybe I should have included a slide. I'll, I'll do that next time. Um, even though they're made out of wood, the upper part of this looks like, um, me, um, uh, excuse me, they look like Renaissance palazzos. So if you would be in Florence or Rome or these kind of things, the square block made out of stone with windows, whether they're square or arched up and above, and then the heavy cantilevered roof supported by these large brackets was a typical Renaissance uh, prototype for an urban palazzo. Um, in, you might say that these individuals, certainly the, ta the people that were promoting the style, um, were seeing this new middle urban middle class as potentially being Medici-like. Um, <laughs> if they could adopt a culture of art, music, reading, but also a leisurely culture of sport, entertainment, you know, uh, gaming, uh, those kind of things. Um, it also is a, how can I say this, it's similar to the Newport situation. Uh, if you were a family living in one of these houses, you would invite friends of a similar status to come over and socialize with you. And again, it might just be two families getting together, 
that if you held a larger evening event, um, it would be to promote socialization between your children and their children and potentially also match make um, and encourage relationships as such. Very fascinating. So I, I know with uh, your last talk, your previous talk, um, uh, you spoke about the different styles of architecture in the United States and mentioning that some were political or politically oriented and some were evolutionary in mm -hmm. a sense. And it, so it makes me wonder, is there with this sort of cultural focus and elitism, if you, if you will, was there a, a backlash in style that followed this? I, I think so. And, and again, there were a number of uh, early styles in the 1930s, like we said, that were popular. Um, certainly, the Greek Revival was extremely popular throughout the United States, and specifically in areas like Philadelphia, Boston, New York City. Um, here in Connecticut, there's an abundance of uh, Greek Revival buildings. And the people who embraced the Greek Revival were really what I would refer to as uh, politically conscious and sort of attempting to be responsible citizens because they wanted an architecture that reflected democratic values. Um, this gets a little bit warped when you head towards the South because that same classicism is turned into Imperial Roman architecture where plantation houses begin to mimic temples instead of you know, the Greek democratic value. Individuals who maybe were more focused on moral issues or uh, wanted to express their um, religious roots, um, Episcopalian roots and so forth, um, may have embraced the Gothic revival that was certainly popular for ecclesiastical architecture and then also spread into things like schools and universities and these kind of things, because again, many of the universities started out as uh, theological uh, mm -hmm. institutions. Um, so there's that. However, if you went carpenter Gothic as opposed to masonry Gothic, so the masonry Gothic tends to mimic the ecclesiastical buildings, whereas the carpenter Gothic tends to become a little bit more whimsical with, you know, the, we saw a few of those in the last lecture with pastel colors and ornate eave carvings and mm -hmm. sort of fanciful windows and uh, those kind of things. Uh, but those individuals tend to be a little bit more interested in the picturesque as such. So apparently, you know, what I've read is that the, you know, the Renaissance revival was really sort of an attempt to uh, bring this concept of taste and culture and to make that connection uh, back to the Renaissance, but at the same time, by making them wood and placing them in the countryside, they're also hearkening to a sort of luxury lifestyle of the villa. Mm -hmm. And of course, the long tradition of going all the way back to Rome of villas being where the elite, you know, escape the city in the summer and go to enjoy nature um, really appealed to these individuals. Um, they're definitely, they could not afford a house in Newport, but, you know, the Connecticut River was the next best thing <laughs> to Newport, Rhode Island. Maybe and better in some cases. Um, a, a few practical questions here. How energy efficient uh, were the Italianate villas in the winter? Um, so they are originally exceptionally great in the summer. If you look at this image that's on the screen here, and what we don't see is that the landscape has not been maintained. So the landscape here, the uh, lawns would have been surrounded with mature growth trees that would have cast shade down on the lawn. So it would be shaded lawn, shaded veranda. Mm -hmm. And the brie, if you heat up the cupola, so if the roof of the cupola, and many times they would be made in metal, 
so they would really absorb the heat. Um, and you open the windows, uh, the cupola serves the stairwell, ab the cupola above the stairwell serves as a chimney and it, the hot air starts to rise and pull out. So it's then taking hot air from the second floor and pulling cool air in from the ground floor. So this apparatus really, if it gets hotter, but you have the shade trees shading the lawn and the overhangs shade the windows. Now, what would happen here is that during the day, all of those second floor windows, the shutters would be closed um, in order to keep the direct sun out, uh, but to let the air come through. And so air would come up from the river or come across um, the orchards. And as we said, um, through those windows and up through the chimney and you'd have this constant airflow. However, as there would and there's no insulation. Oh. So you, you don't necessarily want to be in one of the original 1840 houses in a Connecticut January. <laughs> they were not, <laughs> not intended. They to. were not made as such. And even if you look at the plans, um, they do have small fireplaces, but you can see they're really like a spring fall warm up the room a little bit as opposed to um, uh, sort of uh, stay, you know, warm and cozy all winter long. Yeah. And I think that that's where the salt box and the Georgian um, styles um, are a little bit better for winter occupation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a question about, was that a two room kitchen in the room plan that you showed? Or I think you said the back room was- Yeah, in, in, the, in the one that we're seeing there, um, well, first of all, let's see if, if oh, um, I may have to go forward a second. Okay, in this one here, what you really have is the kitchen is the space that is closest to the main block. And then what would be called a servant's hall a place where the servants would dine and sit when they're not, you know, actually serving uh, would be in the back. And then the stairs go up to um, a men's dorm and a woman's dorm. Often in these houses, you would have a, um, a couple, a husband and wife, he might do the yard uh, work and she would be the sort of full-time cook that would remain in the house all year long. Um, however, they would not inhabit the main part of the house. They would stay in the back wing as such. And you'll even see this in, and I, I'm trying to think, I think it's back further here is the one here. Um, in this one here, you just have the one kitchen below and then the stairs that go up to the dormitory above. So this is a little bit smaller um, area. And so that takes us to our next question, which is about how many square feet did the houses take on? Uh, I'm To tell you the truth, I'm not sure. I can tell you this though. What's interesting to me is this plan is not unlike in its organization, the uh, typical Georgian house or even the smaller salt box. So I think that, you know, we're not really getting something that's, um, sort of a cottage small scale, nor is it getting larger. There's sort of that typical size that continues, but I'm sorry, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, if we're sort of looking there, the rooms are averaging, you know, anywhere roughly like 12 to 14 feet each, you know, um, square or as such. And so, yeah. And typically they'd have high ceilings, wouldn't they? Yes, yes. Yeah. and. So, I mean, we can get into this a, a, a little bit, and I, I uh, mentioned this with my students, that while we consider, we look at this, these Victorian rooms, and let me go to the interior a second. And you're maybe seeing a series of curtains and shears and shutters. In reality, those are the air vents that are letting air in and out of the house. So you can close the exterior shutters and close the vent if you want no air circulation. 
Um, if you want to keep the sun out, but you want air circulation, you can open the vents. If you want to open the shutters um, and you want air to come through, but you want to keep mosquitoes, bugs, and moths out, as I said, shears, while decorative, were the original window screens. Mm -hmm. And they exist to sort of, you know, keep the bugs out and those kind of things. If you're looking um, at many of these rooms, particularly the bedrooms, many of the doors had transom windows above them. Um, and in this situation, you close the door and had privacy, but you open the window to continue to have the airflow up and through the house. And if you wanted the evening air to flow across your bed, you open the lower part of the double hung window and the air would come across the bed and then be sucked out the transom and up through the cupola. On the other hand, if you just wanted to cool down the room but didn't want air on you, you could open the upper part of the double hung window and the air would come across the ceiling and out the transom window. If you wanted to increase the airflow and you weren't too worried about privacy, you could open the door and that would bring you know, more of a breeze through. But you could modulate your airflow from individual rooms by opening doors, opening sliding doors, you know, working your shutters. Some of them have interior shutters and exterior shutters, so you can deal with that also. That sounds like it could have been an all night endeavor to just find the correct. I just think as the season changes, you know, while it's still spring, maybe you want that upper window open in the middle of summer. Maybe you want that lower one open, you know, um, kind of some of those things, but yeah. Very good. We have another question that uh, may um, uh, require some real mental gear turning. Um, so I'll just read it. It's, can you speak about the societal impact of these architectural structures have had upon America? Each structure carries with it a way of seeing the self and the other. The structure carries with it morals, ethics, beliefs, et cetera. Okay. Um, yeah, so I would say that the biggest impact of this house is it really allowed the um, nuclear family and many of the values that we have embraced um, certainly since uh, the Second World War as being um, core values in the United States. Um, the idea that, you know, this is certainly, you know, how can I say this? Um, uh, Father Knows Best could be filmed in an Italianate house. <laughs> You know, this, this is a household where the family gets together for dinner. Um, there's staff, so mother isn't stressed out doing the cooking. She's sitting at the table talking and doing those kind of things. Um, this is a family that gets together after dinner and reads. And there's, again, many novels. You know, you might read Charles Dickens. If you're more conservative, maybe you read a passage from the Bible. If you're more worldly, maybe you read um, poetry or something like that. Um, also, the children are taught to play the piano. The parents interact with the children um, more readily. Um, parents interact with each other. Husbands and wives are expected to have conversations, um, to share opinions. Um, it's, it's even, there's a comment that comes in this uh, yeah, here that, you know, that went along with this engraving of everybody sitting at the table, that the middle-class Victorian family at the dinner table, parents use family meal times to educate their children on religion, conversation, and table manners kind of thing. And so <laughs> you won't see any representation in the colonial world of this kind of intimacy where families are sort of gathering together and uh, socializing and sharing. You may see them working together. You may see them existing in the same space, but not as a family unit kind of thing. Um, and I think 
you know, this is an interesting kind of thing. Like, I'm, I'm not quite sure how welcome ants, uh, maiden ants and, you know, in-laws and these kind of people are actually in this uh, nuclear uh, uh, cannon. Uh, on the other hand, it is interesting because they adopted some of these ideas, obviously, from the emerging bourgeoisie in France and England. You know, America's always been trying to keep up or catch up with Europe. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. At the same time, they established their own class values because they realized they couldn't compete with the real Gilded Age, the Vanderbilts and the Rockefellers and the Astors. They were in a world all on their own. But this was a middle-class uh, world that people could aspire to. I think the concept of the Italianate villa is the same idea that led people to move to suburbia at the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. An idea that, you know, the inner city was dangerous, dirty, unhealthy, and the ideal place to be was to have a a private home for you and your family in a sort of countryside setting, a most bucolic um, environment. Um, this is the beginning of the lawn. You know, if it wasn't for the Italianate villa, I don't know if we'd all have grass lawns all around our houses. But, you know, the idea was that you had this grass lawn to play badminton and uh, bowl, you know, lawn bowling and, and these kind of things. Um, also, the idea of pets really as pets. Um, this idea that you have a dog, a cat, a goat, I don't know, um, a bird, and you play with it. It's not a hunting dog. It's not a work animal. It's a recreational animal as such. Uh, and then, as we said, the beginning of this sort of uh, whole lifestyle of the porch. And I think, you know, we all aspire to, like, Memorial Day is the opening of the, oh, okay, let's open up our deck. Let's have a barbecue. Let's invite people over. We're going to play badminton or we're going to play volleyball. And, you know, if we've really achieved the American dream, it's our family, our extended family, and maybe some close friends in this idyllic um, little world. Uh, so I think that that's sort of the, what we inherited from the Italian eight. And obviously when the upper middle class achieved this, uh, the working class saw this and aspired to have it. And, you know, certainly I think uh, the post, like I said, post-World War II values, people returning from Europe who were living in inner city apartment buildings and so forth said, you know what, we won the war, I deserve my own Italianate villa. King of the castle. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. And um, you know. Another question, and this uh, kind of is a precursor to a question earlier. This style seems so new and modern when first introduced. Was there criticism of it initially, since it was such a dramatic departure from previous styles? Oh, I think you were definitely, this was an age when um, America had a lot of different people with a lot of different ideas, and I'm I'm pretty sure that uh, you adopted a style of house to really sort of present your political, social, religious values um, to the world. You know, choosing an Italianate villa meant that you chose not to have a Gothic or a Greek revival building. Um, if you chose a Gothic revival building, it said something about who you were also. Um, if you chose a Greek revival building, it said something about who you were. And if you chose to stay with a Georgian or, you know, an, a colonial traditional building, it also said something about who you were. I don't know enough. I, I will say this. I think the Italianate villa um, is maybe closer to Republican values 
but I'm talking about Republican values of the, you know, the Abraham Lincoln party, not, you know, as such. Um, because these were people who were executives. They might not be, they might be owners of small businesses, um, successful businesses, but they weren't um, corporate industrialists. They, but they were executives, you know, like I said, you know, upper management who could afford to have a townhouse in Boston, Providence, you know, even New Haven, New York, and could afford to have a summer residence as such. Sure. I, and this may be getting into the weeds a little too much. But we talk about the culture that they would have been uh, exploring and performing and investigating and learning about. Is this the class of people who would have brought tutors with them for the summer or oh, governors? Yeah. So they oh, would have yeah. brought the culture with them in a sense to, to explore and, and educate? Well, I think you would have both. I mean, you know, I think conscientious parents might bring tutors. I mean, I'm sure that there might be some that said, oh, we're going for two months and we're just going to relax and um, socialize. Although, as I said, it was sort of expected within this social group that you know you'll see them reading, you'll see them playing music, um, you'll see them you know the idea of poetry and these kind of things. As I said, you know the uh, exploration of horticulture and botany and sort of studying plants and flowers and insects and animals and those kind of things would definitely uh, be a part of this kind of culture. Sounds so, fabulous. You know, um, but I like, again, like today, I'm sure some parents were like, yeah, you know, you're supposed to be studying your math or your philosophy, but, you know, you're reading Dickens instead, you know, you're, binge, you're binging Dickens instead <laughs> of, you know, doing your studying kind of thing. And yet I'm sure there were others where mothers became more active and said, well, we're going to, you know, study for a few hours and do this and that. I can tell you this, um, and this would be very strange to us. All of these households had schedules and everybody obeyed the schedule. So it was sort of like everybody gets up and we have family breakfast at nine o'clock. And at, you know, at 9.45 or 10 o'clock, father's going to go into the library and do work for two hours. Mother's going to go and, you know, meet with the staff or whatever. The children are going to do this and this. Naps are scheduled. Changes of clothes are scheduled. Getting together for dinner is scheduled. Like, literally, the day is entirely scheduled. And people go apart for hours at a time and then they come back together for hours at a time and then they go apart again. So if you know if father goes into his study for two hours after breakfast, you don't wander in and say, let's read a book. That that doesn't happen. You know, like family reading time is the hour after dinner from you know seven to eight or whatever, and then, or, or eight to nine or whatever, and then so-and-so goes to bed and that kind of stuff. Um, so it's very structured, but it's also structured in a way that things happen. And that's probably what didn't happen during COVID. Right. You know, people were sort of together, but they weren't really structuring their time to be together kind of thing. And so what's interesting about this house is there's times when people spend a certain amount of time every day away from each other, alone. And then there's times when the whole family comes together and then there's times when the mother and father are together. And then there's times when the children are just together um, and those kind of things. But those, those schedules were derived within the, the individual family. Mm -hmm. so. And then they would also schedule when they would come out here, like, oh, you know, I don't know, like 
uh, on Monday, we go hiking. On you know Tuesday, we go swimming. On Wednesday, we go fishing. Um, activities would be scheduled like that um, as such. So it's not, you know, like, it's not like us where we get an Airbnb and show up and then everybody just sort of lounges around for three <laughs> days, binge watching TV and snacking and, you know, no, 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 no. Um, there's a, a real sort of, you know, cause we have records where like when people are arriving and even like I said, um, when are snacks, you know, we're gonna have snack, mm -hmm. like we're, we're all going to get together in casual clothes on the veranda and have tea and snacks and play some yard games. And then we're going to come in and take a nap. Yeah. We're all going to come in and, you know, the kids are going to go upstairs and everybody, and we're going to get undressed. We're going to take a nap and then we're going to redress differently and come down for dinner. I'm, so yeah. I'm reminded of, um, if you've ever been to the Mohawk Mountain House, uh, very similar, different architecture, but similar air cooling uh, mm. architecture in that sense with transom windows and porches, et cetera. And the schedule it <laughs> rules over everything, particularly the meals and the snack schedule. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, because again, it is a, um, it's a system. But what's really funny is, and I have to say this, um, it's almost because coming out of the colonial period when there was no real intimate family unit and your goal is to sort of create this nuclear family, it's as if the parents need a schedule so they know actually how to be a nuclear family. <laughs> You know, it's sort of like if we follow this schedule and I can just imagine, you know, various women a scheduling like tea with friends at, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon on so-and-so's veranda, sitting around going over their schedules and comparing <laughs> who's having success with their schedule and who's not. And, you know, whose kids are, you know, in a good mood and whose kids are moody uh, kind of thing because the schedule isn't quite, you know, in sync yet. Oh, that's interesting. That's really interesting. It makes me want to go back and look at a bunch of information from that time period to see what, what the influence of the schedules was. On the other hand, I have to say this. I think if you were a kid and you were coming out of the inner city and you were going here, um, and I would say if you had an amiable personality, um, this would be great. Sure. You know, it would be like, oh, we're getting up, we're having dinner, and then we're going to go and do this. And then, you know, I have like, oh, it's time to go and, you know, mom and dad are having tea. We're going to play with the dog. We're going to play some, you know, lawn ball. We're going to do that. I'm going to change around. I get a bath. We're going to go <laughs> swimming. We're going to go into the orchard. We're going to go hiking. <laughs> we're going to go fishing. You know where you stand. Kind of thing. It's, it's sort of like a, a week long trip to great adventure <laughs> for, for, for someone who's, trapped in the inner city you know you can't do any of that um during the rest of the year when you're in the inner city kind of thing mm -hmm. so there's you know a, probably a lot of studying you know it gets dark earlier it's not safe it's dirty kind of thing um, oh that's fascinating thank you if anybody has any other questions now's the time to put them in the chat or if you prefer go ahead and unmute your mic and shout one out. Let me go back, you know. I, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say thank you. Oh, hey, Laurent, you're very welcome. My pleasure. It was interesting. Okay. Very much so. Thank you for your comment. All right, if there are no other questions, we are going to release you to your weekend. Well, thank you all very much for attending and listening. I'm hoping it was um, fun and maybe a little enlightening. And if you get an opportunity and you're driving around, you know, you can uh, obviously check out these different uh, Italianate buildings that are around. Uh, as I said, even here in the uh, Chapin house, um, you can see some of the trees and some of these things, but unfortunately, I don't think that, um, people while they again while they restore the physical part of the house they don't necessarily capture the landscape 
And the landscape was really a critical part of fulfilling all of this. Um, you know, in, in its most romantic moment, if you can imagine sitting on the porch in some wicker furniture with tea or an aperitif or something like that while the sun is setting and a breeze is blowing and you get the sort of scent of peaches or apples flowing in while your kids are playing with their dog in the yard and those kind of thing. It really is this kind of idyllic um, view of the American dream. Very much so. Thank you so much for uh, that one image pretty much captures <laughs> exactly what Good job, we're Ted. Uh, wonderful. Thank you all so much for turning out for Thanks, uh, Ted. Also of Thank our you, team. Ted. Good work. Okay. <laughs> well, and we hope to see you at an Essex Library program again soon. Take care. Good night. Thanks, Ann. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.